Welcome to ESGX Live, our global community for education and information, which we hope inspires collaboration and action on all things to do with sustainability with me, Nigel Lake, here in New York, and my co-host, Paul Herman, in San Francisco. For everyone who's joined us from the Asia Pacific region, thank you very much for getting up rather early. A good evening to everyone in Europe and Africa, and of course, good afternoon to those of you who are with us in the Americas. A quick reminder, uh, the Q&A function is there so that you can ask your questions. So please do use that and bring that in and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Introduce yourselves to each other in the chat, say hello, and you may want to share resources and your perspectives as we go through what is gonna be, a, I think, a really fantastic discussion today. Also, if you're watching on social media, use the like or share buttons. This really helps amplify the message and get it out to a, a wider group of people than might otherwise hear it. We have a really excellent discussion coming up. Uh, shortly with Philippe Cousteau and others. Uh, before we do, I'm going to hand over to Doug Heskey from New Day Impact to introduce the discussion. So Doug, over to you. Nigel, thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank everybody who has joined this afternoon's session, especially our speakers. We are expecting more than 250 attendees today, close to a record for our live audience on ESGX. This attendance has much to do with World Oceans Day but is also demonstrative of the number of people that care about this really important issue. And we should care for good reason. I heard a shocking statistic last week that was reported by Reuters in January of 2020, that the Worldwide Fund for Nature, an international conservation agency, stated that the average person is now ingesting five grams of plastic every week, about the weight of a credit card. That's both disgusting and alarming. Imagine eating a credit card every single week. Imagine if you had a newborn at home and you told your wife or your husband that. This is incredibly troublesome given that many of these plastics introduce high levels of toxicity into the human body. But sadly, that's only where the story begins. Ocean plastics are estimated to kill more than 1 million marine animals every year from the uh, estimated 100 million tons of plastics that are currently in our oceans at every level. Over 99% of this plastic is made from chemical sources from fossil fuels, and the major fossil fuel companies are deeply connected to this problem. The plastic industry is poised to invest billions of dollars in expanding plastic production over the coming years, and the International Energy Agency predicts that plastics consumption of oil is going to outpace that of cars by 2050. Plastic is literally everywhere in our clothing, our food, our consumables, and credit cards. Think about it this way. There are roughly 1.25 billion credit cards produced each year, enough cards to encircle the earth three times if stacked end to end. But everything is relative, right? How many plastic milk jugs, plastic water bottles are produced every year? 50 billion water bottles just here in the US. Do you know how many gallons of oil are consumed to make that? 17 million gallons of oil, enough to fuel 1.3 million cars for more than a year. Just here in the US, we consume 1,500 plastic water bottles every second. It's also estimated that by 2015, 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. So is the plastic problem an important issue to address? Absolutely. And that's what we're here to talk about today. This isn't just an issue about getting oil and gas companies engaged, product manufacturing engaged, and to think about things, the problem in a different way. It's in part a collective action problem. And consumers are looking for ways in which they can personally engage in the effort to mitigate climate change through reduction of carbon footprint, to adopting different behaviors like purchasing eco-friendly products, and that includes credit cards and other plastic goods. This is an issue that's become a defining symbol of humanity's collective relationship with the planet and one that every one of us has the ability to address and incorporate into our daily lives. So that brings us to today's session and the incredible group of change makers and evangelists that we have gathered for the sake of our oceans and biosystems. It was just a few months ago that we struck a formal relationship with Earth Echo International at New Day, a nonprofit organization established by Philippe and Alexandra Cousteau in honor of their father, Philippe Cousteau Sr., 
and their legendary grandfather, Jacques Cousteau. New Day and Earth Echo International have been a really good match over the last couple of months, expanding our youth education to the national stock market game and speaking to many other members of our community. Earth Echo International is also an advisor to New Day on our ocean health investment portfolio. And we have collectively been working to inspire people worldwide to act for a more sustainable future by getting informed, getting involved, and getting invested in the issues that we care so much about. New Day contributes 5% of our revenues to Earth Echo International to support their work that they and only they can do in support of ocean health and sustainability. Philippe will lead today's discussion and will also be joined by Sadie Blancaflor, a young woman who has been uh, greatly accomplished a lot of things as a part of Earth Echoes International's youth initiative. Following Philippe and Sadie will be a panel of executive leaders who are doing truly innovative work tied to solutions for the singles use plastic problem. The panel will include Tom Zasky, CEO of TerraCycle, Linda Pouliot, CEO and founder of Dishcraft Robotics, and Kiko Nicolini, Chief Marketing Officer for RCUP. Leading this discussion will be Matt Printeville, CEO of Upstream Solutions. Following our panel of executives, we will have a fireside chat with Lena Konstantinovici, the founder of Innovation 4.4, and Kurt Lieberman, President and Co-Portfolio Manager for New Day's Ocean Health Portfolio. Both Lena and Kurt are distinguished leaders in the impact investing field and have for decades uh, been working in both public and private companies. They understand the nature of where real impact occurs and the work that needs to be done to drive transformational change. So without further ado, I'd like to pass things off to my friend and colleague, Philippe Cousteau, and looking forward to having everybody as a part of this very important discussion this afternoon. Well, thank you, Doug. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, the video, I think the host has to actually enable the video here. It's telling me, but can you all hear me? We can indeed, and the video will be on in a second. All righty. Let's see, there we go, all right. Well, Doug, as always, my friend, good to see you, and thank you for the introduction uh, and, and setting that context. It's a, a, a great example in the scope and scale of this issue and why I'm so delighted to be here with you all on World Ocean Day. Happy World Ocean Day. Um, it is, uh, is an important day to reflect and remember the, the, the vital contribution that the ocean makes every day to our lives. Uh, and of course, to reflect on the impact that we're having on the ocean. Um, you know, we, we've learned a lot about the ocean of the last few decades. In fact, I'm struck, and I think it's important to remember a little context. It was really 77 years ago that my grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, first stepped into the Marne River outside of Paris with this new invention, the Aqualone, uh, what he called the, the Scaphandre Autonome, that was revolutionary. Um, at the time, you know, we have to remember that, that most of what we knew about the ocean was what we threw in in, in pollution and what we pulled out in seafood. Uh, the images that we take for granted today of, of, of Nemo and, and, and sharks and were, were mysteries to most people um, until my grandfather co-invented scuba diving and took underwater cameras and um, 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 video, video cameras underwater and made documentaries and, and really opened the world's eyes to this wondrous place. Um, Ironically uh, and tragically, in that period of time, because you know when my grandfather started out uh, the, the days of World War II and right after World War II, we had yet to see the massive industrial explosion that was the post-war world, uh, population and, and, and economic and industrial uh, growth that was um, unprecedented. So he was able to see the last few years of a relatively healthy ocean ecosystem around the world. Um, you know, if you look back at those old videos of the silent world in the 1940s that he filmed in the Red Sea and off the coast of southern France, uh, you see giant grouper and schools of sharks and, and majestic coral reefs. And you go back to those same places today, particularly off the coast of southern France, and um, um, those places are, are, are gone, essentially. Uh, the Dead Sea and uh, the, Red, the Mediterranean, excuse me, the Red Mediterranean is, is largely a dead ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things that uh, having that perspective and that uh, experience, those experiences growing up, growing up with his stories really had an impact on me. 
um, because it's important to remember the context and, and that shifting baseline, as we call it, the idea that you know, if every successive generation has its perspective on what the health of the environment is from when they were young. And yet when we go back just a few decades, the world was a very different place. And now we're inundated with plastics. We see dead zones proliferating on the world. At least half the world's corals are, are gone or disappearing. Um, and we're, we're struck and faced with uh, challenges that, that are, I believe are unprecedented in human history. We face war, we face famine, we face disease. But never um, a crisis like this, this climate crisis that is, is threatens to consume us all. Uh, and that is largely made by us. And there's the bad news, but that's also the good news. Um, we have disrupted the environmental systems, largely the ocean systems, that um, are, are critical to life on Earth. And yet, in the same way that we've disrupted them, we have the power to restore them and to think differently and to innovate. And that's really important. Today on World Ocean Day, one of the topics we've discussed a lot is this idea of what we call 30 by 30, the concept that we need to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030, and that there are tools like um, the protection of, of marine or the establishment of marine protected areas that work um, in the world today as a, as a, as a management tool um, for how we can restore the ocean to abundance, even in the face of climate change. And, um, and those kinds of tools, I think, are important to dwell on as much as, as the problems, the solutions, because we talk about problems. We talk about doom and gloom a lot. Um, and I think we need to we need to embrace a little bit more what are the opportunities? What are the paths and what are the solutions? And what can those, what kind of a world and a future can those solutions create for us? Fear is a short-term motivator. Vision, hope, opportunity are long-term motivators. I think we need a lot more of that in the ocean space because I do believe there's an opportunity. And the incredible panelists that we have today are testament to that about how we can use innovation how we can use new ideas in order to change the world. Uh, I have a two-year-old daughter and uh, at, at 41 now, um, I think to myself, you know, in the last 40 years, we have destroyed around half of the world's biodiversity. And every time I look at her or any child, I think to myself, how dare we? How dare we diminish the world to buy bigger houses, faster cars, to line our pockets with the, the, the destruction of, of their planet. Um, it's a terrible legacy that we've created over the last 70 some odd years. But again, it is a legacy that we can undo, I believe. In particular, through Earth Echo, my work um, is focused on education and working with young people. And um, if there's anything that gives me hope about the future, it's them. When we think about the global campaigns like um, 30 by 30, you know, as I mentioned, protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030. When we think about campaigns around um, innovation and, and new technologies and in, in, in green business and in the blue economy, um, we have a generation that is fired up, that is optimistic and determined like no other. I remember Doug and I were talking about this not long ago. When we were in high school, you maybe had the recycling club. But what we're seeing in a new generation today is a level of sophistication that's unprecedented. Social media, the internet, they're more informed and collaborative than ever before. And they have a, a wealth of knowledge and resources at their fingertips. And so what we see with young people is young people like Ella in, in southern um, England that we worked with and, and her work at eight years old to change laws and get the companies in her community to the, the, the businesses in her community to go plastic, single use plastic free at eight. Um, we see young, young women that we work with and young men and women starting businesses um, or like Delaney in Florida helping to draft legislation at 13 years old to require solar, build, solar panels on, on new buildings in, in Southern Florida and Miami. We see uh, young people in, in um, uh, like Michelle Machiwa in, in Kenya that we work with who are gathering community members and business leaders and government officials around galvanizing them around Lake Victoria and the importance of, of, of protecting that lake in the face of climate change or young people in the Galapagos, Argentina. My point is we work with young people around the world that are connected into a community like no other ever in history. And that's a force for, and a, and a, and a, and a powerful force for good. And that's what, really what gives me hope. And so um, to that point, we actually invited one of our youth leaders, uh, Sadie Mlanka to join us today 
Um, she is an extraordinary uh, youth leader. She's a member of our Youth Leadership Council. Um, she is an inspiration. Um, she is a, a, a anthropology and uh, environmental systems, political anthropology student at Stanford University. Um, she's worked in a, a number of national organizations, youth-led climate organizations like Baltimore Beyond Plastic, um, interviewing climate activists. Um, she's worked at, uh, 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 she's the co-director of Bail, the uh, Bay Area organization that seeks to apply a cultural lens to sustainable eating. Um, in addition to that, she's the co-chair of the PowerShift Network and is the National Reinvestment Director for the College Climate Coalition. She's very familiar with the idea of reinvestment and um, innovation in technology and innovation in business um, and is, uh, is an inspiration. So I, we invited her because you can listen to me talk about the power of young people all day long. Much better for you to hear from them. Um, so I wanted to actually uh, um, have bring Sadie on here. She is and have her chat a little bit and share some, some stories and her inspiration, a little bit about uh, what she's up to. And uh, you can see a little bit about, uh, about how extraordinary um, her work is. And then, uh, then we'll move on into, uh, into the panel. So Sadie. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Philippe. And I'm really grateful to be here. You know, it's plastic works and plastic and, and oceans um, that has brought me into the climate space today. Um, so this is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. Like Philippe said, um, my name is Sadie and I'm a rising senior at Stanford majoring in earth systems and political anthropology. And I'm really happy to be here representing Earth Echo International and to be speaking to the power of youth activism. I started my activism journey uh, when I was 16 and my best friend and I learned about a statewide styrofoam ban that was working its way through the Maryland General Assembly. I was specifically drawn to this bill in particular by the immense waste that I saw in the Baltimore City public school system. Every day, over 80,000 styrofoam trays went into trash cans and cafeterias across the city. Not only that, but when researching the bill more, I was distraught to learn that styrofoam leaches carcinogens into hot food and releases harmful fumes when incinerated. I had eaten off of these styrofoam trays since kindergarten, accumulating these toxins for over a decade. In response, with my best friend, I launched Baltimore Beyond Plastic, a youth-led organization dedicated to solving the issue of plastic pollution. And I knew we couldn't do it alone. So we turned to other students. I taught Baltimore City public school students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade about the dangers of styrofoam, led workshops to build their advocacy skills and planned rallies. Mobilizing nonprofits, students and Baltimoreans, our team took to the streets. We surveyed small businesses, explained what a styrofoam bill would entail and collected signatures in neighborhoods across the city. I also helped set up meetings between council members and students passionate about banning styrofoam. And six months later, we had organized hundreds of students to rally and testify in the hearing room as the bill was debated. It passed and we were so thrilled. And not only that, city council president, Jack Young, specifically credited the youth in the room for getting the bill passed because the previous three times when we weren't around <laughs> that had been introduced, um, the bill had completely failed. He said, it was the school children here who convinced me I asked them questions and they came back with really tough answers. They were really educated and knew exactly what they wanted to say. That was my segue into the climate and plastic world. And today, like Philippe mentioned, I currently serve in a variety of roles advocating for climate legislation and um, supporting youth climate activists across the country and even in Canada. And I'm super excited to be here today um, to chat more about this topic that again, is very near and dear to my heart as youth climate activism and activism um, is going to pave the way for our future. You know, Sadie, I'm struck because I, I you know, you, you, you look at really any great social movement in, in history, civil rights, women's rights, et cetera, and it's always led by a younger generation. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that we face and have faced in the environmental movement as a whole has been um, a, a rather short-sighted approach to conservation. Um, and both of those issues are addressed today. One is we've largely, uh, the movement, uh, underinvested in education and in empowering and, and looking at how we build and grow the constituency of people that care about these issues. Because fundamentally, what we need is political change. As you saw, Sadie is already deeply engaged in that work. 
you don't, um, um, you know, and, and, and this old belief that, that adults are the ones that are, that are going to fix this um, can be uh, misguided sometimes. And I think we've, we've spent too much time preaching to the converted and not enough time, again, expanding that audience. And the best way to expand that audience is through education and engagement. What, what do you think is, um, is the opportunity going forward? What do you see amongst your peers? I mean, do you find that this is an issue that, that is growing in, in prominence and importance amongst your generation? What's next? How do we enhance and, and supercharge that work? Absolutely. I, I definitely see more and more students getting engaged in this work. Before, you know, it was mainly environmental science majors or people that have always been interested in, you know, the birds and the outdoors. But now when I look around in my circles, I have, we, I see my friends who are neuroscience majors or math majors, and, you know, they're completely dedicated to solving the issue of the climate crisis because we know that this is the biggest issue facing our generation and all the generations after us. That's, 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 um, that's what we need, right? We need that, that growing constituency. What do you see in terms of the, the, the big hurdles and the big opportunities going forward for youth, for this, this growing global movement? That's a great question. I think, you know, Earth Echo International is often students don't even know where to turn to or where to even begin. And that's why I really appreciate, you know, being working with Earth Echo International and, and seeing all the resources that you're dedicating to help support youth, you know, take that first step. And it, it really is about taking that first step and seeing the specific issues or ways that you can plug in and feel connected to the work. Um, so I think it, it looks like tangible actions would be to help support students, you know, in identifying the issues facing um, their communities and, and support them in, in getting connected to the right folks um, that can help guide them on their path. Well, I, uh, I appreciate that. I, I obviously agree. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that uh, that's one piece of the puzzle that I mentioned earlier is, is reinvesting and investing more in education. The other piece of the puzzle, which is what we're gonna be talking about here next, um, I'm gonna introduce Matt shortly, um, is this idea of innovation. Right. Um, you pointed out, or as I pointed out in, in when I was talking about your bio, your work in reinvestment. And uh, that's I'd love to hear from you just for a moment before we bring that on and the, the panel, because when we think about innovation in business, oftentimes those have not gone hand in hand with the idea of conservation. Um, we've talked about environmental movement, doom and gloom and don't do this, can't do that. Don't you know, forget that, um, as opposed to looking at the opportunity that embracing the blue economy that looking at innovative solutions to these problems can provide jobs and opportunity for people. Uh, and that um, business um, and in, in investment plays an important role in innovation, uh, plays an important role in solving these problems. You have some experience with that. What do you think? Yeah, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. I currently serve as National Reinvestment Chair for the College Climate Coalition. And it, it sort of toggles off of the divestment aspect. You know, there's there are ways to make bad investments and that's, you know, investing in corporations that have, you know, destroyed our planet, like the fossil fuel industry, um, and continue to not take responsibility for, for the role in disseminating um, fake science. And then there's also this opportunity, this really unique opportunity to invest in communities that have been the most impacted by climate change and invest in solutions that will bring us closer. Um, to what we need to see, which is the decarbonization of our society. And um, we need, we, quite frankly, we, we continue to lack the funds to, to get us there. Um, and it, it looks not only like investing in, in solar panels and wind turbines and increasing like our understanding of the technology behind renewable energy, but also we're starting to see the impacts of climate change on our communities in California we just suffered the most, one of the most devastating wildfire seasons um, in history. And in Alaska, where my family lives, we're, we're starting to see, you know, whole like coastlines go underwater and with the melting of permafrost and um, things of that nature. And it's, it's really devastating. And that also requires, you know, funds. How do we help support those communities relocate or get the resources they need? So there's definitely, definitely spaces um, where institutional investment can plug in. It's about as much about people as it is the planet, which are 
intricately intertwined. Um, well, Sadie, I want to introduce Matt here. Stick around, but uh, um, uh, Matt is uh, going to lead us into the into the panel of some really extraordinary people that we that we are privileged. I, I met Tom, had the pleasure of meeting Tom many many years ago, and I'm a huge fan. Uh, and of course, Keiko and Linda do tremendous work as well. Uh, and Matt um, is no slouch himself. He's a recognized thought leader with the plastic pollution community. Uh, he invited he advises the United Nations Environment Program on their plastic pollution strategies. Uh, he's one of the founders of, uh, of the global Break Free from Plastic movement and the founder of the Cradle to uh, Coalition, Make It, uh, uh, Make It, Take It campaign. He helped establish and advance the Electronics Take Back Coalition, the Multi-State Mercury Campaign, the Safer Chemicals and Healthy Families Coalition. I think you get the point. He's done some really astonishingly outstanding work. Um, he's written for lots of different magazines, uh, Guardian Green Biz, Sustainable Brands, and he's been featured in The Economist, New York Times, NPR, um, you name it. Um, he's, a, he's a thought leader in this space, and uh, we're really fortunate to have him to be able to guide this conversation um, with three other amazing thought leaders on the panel. So, uh, Matt, awesome. over to you. Philippe, thanks for that very, very nice introduction. And just want to say that it is a real honor to be here with all of you on World Oceans Day. And I could not be more excited uh, about the conversation we've got in store for you. So I run an organization called Upstream, and we work to spark innovative solutions to plastic pollution by helping people, businesses, and communities shift from single use to reuse. And I just want to get into it. I want to ask you folks to think about the last time that you ordered uh, takeout for dinner or you had a meal delivered to your home or your office building. And I want you to think about all of the different single use products that came with that meal, right? The bags, the takeout containers, the plastic cutlery wrapped in more plastic, the napkins, the ketchup packets. It's crazy, right? And this is just our current normal, right? This is the way it's done 99.99% of the time here in the United States and around the world. And it's also the normal for how we get most of our beverages and pretty much everything we get at the grocery store and order online. One way, throw away, single use packaging. And the bottom line is that we can't provide a decent standard of living for seven and a half billion people and growing on this one way throwaway model. It just uses up way too many natural resources, way too much energy, uh, and of course it creates way too much waste and too much plastic pollution. But our friends on the panel are working to change all that. These are the founders and leaders of innovative companies that are working to usher in a new reuse economy for takeout, delivery, consumer packaged goods, events, and more. So I'm very pleased to introduce Linda Pouliot, who is the founder and CEO of Dishcraft. Keiko Nicolini, who is the Chief Marketing Officer and General Manager for R Cup and R Wear, and Tom Zaki, who is the Founder and CEO of TerraCycle and Loop Store. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. Linda, I'm going to actually start with you. Can you please just share a little bit about who you are, what your business is all about, uh, where you're located, and one thing that you're excited about this summer? Sure. So we started in 2015 in the Bay Area and we're, uh, the company's called Dishcraft and we operate like a linen service where we are providing clean dishes and containers every day to food services. Um, the restaurant industry originally reached out to us because there was uh, someone who was on the board of a chain that had 22 restaurants. And he said, look, we really can't deal with all the waste and the inefficiencies. They're using a lot of water. They're using a lot of chemicals. Since COVID started uh, with meal delivery and to go wares, the amount of waste was just astronomical and he couldn't deal with it. So we are solving the safety, sustainability, and labor issues facing the entire industry. We're, like I said, we're operating like a linen service. Every day we drop off, um, immaculately clean dishes and containers, we give those clients a very nice, neat, tidy collection system to collect all the dirties. Then we take those dirties back to a centralized dishwashing hub that is powered by robots and we wash them. And so the advantage of robots is they're very consistent. We can see things that the human eye can't actually pick up. And so we inspect everywhere 22 different times at different angles. We are able to use, recirculate our water, so we use far less water and far less chemicals. 
And we also can use where every single wear now can be washed and reused 250 times. And so that is much better for the environment. Um, no, we also, since COVID, have developed new technology so that we do end-to-end -end touchless handling of wares. So no human hand has actually touched that plate until it gets to the chef. So we, our goal is to have the safest, cleanest possible plate. We're well on our way. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, we're just in the Bay Area. And now we're looking to expand geographically. A couple of things is we are using a quarter of the water and a tenth of the energy of a traditional dish room. Because you can imagine that in a traditional dish room, there's a person who's sitting there spraying water like crazy, like you do at home when you're washing your own dishes. And this is just a far more efficient system. Uh, per location, we are saving a ton of waste and we're reducing uh, CO2 by 29 metric tons per year on average. So we're really, really excited about that. And right now we're serving the hospitality industry, corporate cafeterias, healthcare, and schools. Great. What I'm most excited about this summer is to continue to expand. Like we're, we're making an impact and we're really, really happy. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Keiko, you're, you're next. Uh, same, same question to you. Just tell a little bit about uh, who you are, a uh, little bit about the, the business, uh, where you're based, and one thing you're excited about this summer. I will. Hi, thanks so much for having us, Matt. Um, I am here to uh, talk to you about our cup and our uh, food service where our where. Uh, we began in 2017 uh, servicing the live events industry where we are targeting uh, one vessel and one vessel only, the single use cup. Uh, in North America alone on a, on a non-COVID, non-pandemic regular year, um, the live events industry conservatively generates over 4 billion single use cups, most of which uh, do not make it to any kind of recycling infrastructure. And so by targeting one simple laser focused effort, we uh, have been able to displace millions and millions and millions of, of uh, units from, from landfill. We uh, began to market in 2017. Uh, we uh, begin our work much like uh, what Sadie and Philippe were talking about uh, through education. So we uh, are a complete turnkey solution uh, for large scale events, beginning with education, campaign, marketing. Uh, we then uh, deliver our inventory of cups and reusables to stadiums and arenas. Uh, we help to execute all of the service. We train everybody from the operations team to the concessionaires and servers, to the waste management team. Uh, we consult to the marketing department, uh, each for artists and sports teams and arenas and sometimes cities. Then we pick up uh, all of our used inventory at the end of events, bring them to our uh, centralized wash hub, and then uh, wash, sanitize, restock, and then provide an environmental um, impact report to our partners so they can continue to um, have the conversation about the impact of our activations. We began to market in partnership with um, some, some really, really world-class uh, artists and musicians. Our first tour was uh, out with U2. Uh, we've been out with the Rolling Stones and Rod Stewart, Maggie Rogers, Dave Matthews Band. And the idea is to, um, to partner with musicians and have them help us amplify and educate around the need uh, to address the plastic waste and single use waste crisis. Um, we uh, have partnered with Ecolab and have our own uh, washing facilities in all but one market, and that's Northern California, where we're very, very excited to be working with Dishcraft. Um, and, and that's a big part of what we do in looking at and promoting uh, the reuse landscape overall, is how can we engage um, are not necessarily competitors, but collaborators to help accelerate um, innovative solutions to, to our plastic crisis. 
Um, right. What I'm most excited for this summer, um, I am so, so excited that live events are coming back. It's just, yeah. it's, we can't wait. We can't wait. Absolutely. Absolutely. Me too. Great. Well, Tom, it's on to you, you know, just a little bit about yourself, uh, the company where, where you're based and, and uh, one thing you're excited about this summer. Right on. Thank you, Matt. And thanks everyone. And great to see some, uh, some great friends here uh, and everyone really sort of focusing on, you know, very much this important issue, you know, for TerraCycle, we've been around for just under 20 years. Uh, we operate in uh, 22 countries, uh, two is a nonprofit, Thailand and India, and then the balance is a mission driven uh, for profit. And uh, we have a mission to eliminate uh, the idea of waste. And we do that in sort of three major ways. The first is collect and recycle things that are otherwise not traditionally recyclable. Hundreds of different uh, waste streams. Many could be funded by brands or retailers, free to consumers, or uh, or, or paid directly uh, by individuals. Then we focus on how do we integrate waste back into products, uh, including ocean and river plastic, but many other forms of, uh, of materials as well, so that these uh, waste streams can be then used in other uh, products. And then most recently, we launched a platform called Loop, uh, which is all about how to shift from single use or disposable consumption to reusable consumption. Uh, so it's a platform for reuse where organizations, uh, brands can enter and develop reusable versions of their products. Uh, today, about 150 consumer product companies are joined and then retailers uh, all over the world uh, can then make that available to their consumers. This is live now. Just last week, we launched in Japan and that's adding on to uh, live platforms in the UK, uh, France, US. US and Canada. Um, and uh, it's been pretty amazing to see how interested uh, not just uh, individuals, uh, but lawmakers, uh, brands, retailers are in the reuse movement. And you're hearing wonderful examples uh, on, uh, you know, from Arcup uh, and, and Dishcraft who are really bringing this forward. Um, you know, what I'm excited about is, uh, 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 you know, how far can we and I say bring back the reuse movement because it's how the world used to be, you know, really until about the 1950s. Uh, and uh, but in, in a really modern way that meets people where they are. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we help in all these ways to, you know, really eliminate all the waste that's ending up in uh, in uh, in our oceans, uh, but also our landfills and incinerators. Just jump in with a real quick question, Tom, and there's a great one in the chat here around the global south and specifically India. Might be great just to hear a little bit about what you're doing there. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the, to be very fair to the question, you know, the, the core work TerraCycle does uh, works very well from a business context in developed countries. So the 20 countries where we operate as a for-profit, you know, uh, are all what you would call like, you know, primary markets like Australia or Japan or uh, China, UK. We did as a foundation or open a foundation starting in Thailand, focusing exclusively on river cleanups. So in Thailand, we are have a fleet of river cleanup devices deployed. And uh, just last year alone, pulled about half a million uh, pounds of waste out of the rivers. And due to that success, are expanding that now uh, into India. And in, 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 in India, in addition to, uh, to working on rivers like the Ganges and so on, to be able to prevent river waste from becoming ocean waste, uh, there's a huge movement of informal uh, collectors, you know, in, in emerging markets, waste pickers or informal collectors are a big part of the waste management ecosystem, but they're not recognized. You know, they're mostly women and children. They don't have identifications. Uh, uh, it, it's really not, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges. And so what we're uh, uh, looking to do is try to uh, enable more markets, more revenue, so that folks can make more money uh, uh, when they're picking waste and then be able to achieve, you know, basic things like just identification so that they can get health care and a bank account and things of that nature nature. Thanks, Tom. So I'm going to, I want to get into the why here. And I really want to understand why, why did you guys start these businesses? You know, what was it that, that compelled you to, you know, do, do the hard work of, of creating um, uh, one of these businesses? And I'm going to, I'm going to go and kind of bounce around here. So Keiko, we're actually going to start with you this time. So I know you're, you're not the founder, but you've been with you, with the company for, for a while now and, and work intimately in, in making it scale. So Love to get into the why, you know, what, what were you folks seeing when you started our cup and our wear? Sure. Um, my, my colleague and dear friend, uh, Michael Martin, has actually spent over 30 years in the sustainability space. Um, his formula and approach has to do with um, marrying culture and business solutions to, to shine a light and solve for, for some of the world's most critical needs. 
And uh, some examples are, uh, he, for example, was the longtime sustainability uh, consultant to Live Nation and spent a decade there trying to solve for, for garbage and, and waste. And that's where he initially uh, saw the need to um, address the single use cup phenomenon. Um, it, it came from, from decades of, of practice. In the last year, we have launched a reusable uh, to-go foodware system called Our Wear, uh, based in Minneapolis, where we've been running our trials. And this really uh, came about by looking for ways to address the increase in to-go waste that you mentioned at our beginning, uh, and use the same uh, systems and processes that we know how to, to implement in the RCUP system, uh, really to address and create impact around uh, single-use waste and, and the uptick in uh, takeout food. Thanks, Keiko. So Linda, same, same question, you know, uh, what, what was it that compelled you to do, do the hard work of starting a business, especially with robots? I got to imagine that that there's no, no small uh, order of, of, of business right there. Yeah, so my co-founder and I really love solving real world problems with technology. And when the industry reached out to us, and they were saying like, hey, we just need a much better solution. We're wasting way too much water. And they had a lot of safety issues because the food industry has like the highest area of slips, falls and trips. And so, you know, after spending enough time, like, look, I started to work in facilities myself and I realized, wow, this is this is a problem. And there's been no innovation for 40 years. So we started, we're really delighted. It's only become more interesting in terms of the impact on waste that we can have since we started. So we're excited. Great. Yeah. Tom, same thing. I mean, I know you've been with TerraCycle for, for 20 years. You've been a serial entrepreneur. You know, what, what, what was it that where you saw the opportunity for Loop Store to come into in the marketplace? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we had a big reflection. We've always had this mission to eliminate the idea of waste since the very, very beginning. And, you know, we went about it through recycling and recycled content and then started asking ourselves, uh, is that enough? You know, is recycling really, you know, can it be a solve to waste? And we realized this is probably around in 2017 that it's critically important, perhaps the most important thing in the short term, but it's not a solution to garbage uh, because the, uh, uh, it's more a solution to the symptom of waste. And if we're going to go deeper, we have to really solve waste at the root cause, which I would believe is not a material type like plastic. Uh, but the idea of dishonoring material by throwing it out after an incredibly short use. And it's really attacking this idea of disposability or single use or any synonym thereof. And, um, you know, then the exploration sort of led to, well, what is needed to help uh, bring reuse out? And uh, I think you're hearing a lot of examples of, of, of different uh, uh, derivatives of what will help reuse, you know, come to life. Um, and, uh, you know, the world is ready. You know, I, it was really, you can mark this uh, almost on the calendar that garbage went from being a problem to a crisis at the end of 2017, early 18. You know, it's when Blue Planet 2 came out. It's when you started seeing the turtle with a straw up its nose on your social media feed. It's when Greta came onto the scene. I mean, whatever indicator you would use, everything started happening in the world. Everyone suddenly understood what ocean plastic is, what the problem is, and people are really craving solutions. So it's also the timing. Uh, it was a really important moment. Um, and I think now what's important for all of us uh, is to galvanize that momentum, uh, uh, you know, get through the pandemic, which hasn't been easy for the reuse movement, uh, and then to bring solutions that meet people where they are. And I think we have a real opportunity uh, to do something that wasn't a possibility to do, you know, in a, in a big way 10, 20 years ago. All right. So let's, let's talk about where you guys are at today. You know, I think what I'm interested to know is, is that, you know, how do you want to scale your business from where you're at today and, and what do you need in order to do that? Um, and Tom, we'll start, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, on, on the loop side, uh, I mean, TerraCycle is growing and it's really in a growth company mode. We're now at about 500 people on that, on, on, on that organization in uh, on loop, which is much, much newer. 
what, what, what is really important is, you know, we started with online testing platforms. You can still experience that at loopstore.com, but they've more or less served their goal. And uh, uh, most of them now will be sunsetting uh, because it's now into the next phase where retailers uh, in the U.S., retailers like Kroger and Walgreens, but 15 other major retailers around the world are bringing it in store and becoming the sort of main distributor. And even places like McDonald's and Burger King, uh, you'll, see, you'll see it picked up. And what this is really important for us for is it brings scale. Because in the end, where you know the type of partners we work with at Loop would be these major manufacturers. I mean, we work with startups as well, but it's the big ones that are going to really make or break it. Companies like P&G or Nestle. And what we have to show is that reusable packaging forms can be straight up competitive with disposable packaging forms. And the way to achieve that is is massive, massive scale to be able to bring the cost per units down. And it can be, it can get there. It's been modeled and so on, but now it has to be demonstrated with scale. So what we're incredibly focused on is how do we get that scale quickly? And, and, uh, 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 and that really comes down to very simple things, you know, having more stores implement in physical stores and then having the product ranges become bigger and then driving more units uh, through the ecosystem. And what's exciting about that is then everyone benefits. It becomes cheaper for emerging companies, small retailers, everyone to be able to take part uh, because, you know, in the end, we are as, as a reusable movement. It doesn't matter, you know, what preface you give. We have to be competitive against disposable consumption, and that's incredibly convenient and absolutely, you know, uh, cheap. And so that's that's what we have to beat at at the same terms, not just winning because it is more sustainable. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, the de defeating convenience, you know, or like making reuse as convenient as disposability is is such a big part. And the in, the infrastructure, I want to get into your vision and around infrastructure because I think that's a really important piece. We need we need infrastructure to, to make all this this happen. So uh, Keiko, let's go over to you. So again, you know, where where are you folks at today, and what do you need to do to to scale and to, into your dreams for the future? So, so where we are today with our cup is just getting back in the swing of things uh, with live events and, and large scale stadiums and arenas. Uh, with our wear, we're just graduating out of our trials in, in Minneapolis and beginning to deliver our reusable to go wear uh, solutions um, in, in other uh, city, cities across the country. You know, as far as what is required to scale um, you know, I, I echo a lot of what Tom has to say as far as getting all stakeholders invested and to the table in creating a collective uh, effort around solutions. And, and what I mean by that is um, for, for us, what we're seeing is uh, legislation and a lot of the work that, that you and, and Miriam are doing at Upstream to push forward uh, either um, uh, taxes and city ordinance, uh, state ordinance to level the playing field around pricing uh, and, and um, putting some financial responsibility alongside uh, single use products in the marketplace or uh, you know, cities and, and states creating and supporting uh, infrastructure solutions for, for reuse as well, whether it be um, collection receptacles on, on uh, the, the corner of, of every city um, or other ways to, to fund reuse innovation. Um, we need, you know, obviously business owners, whether they be our concessionaires or restaurant operators and hospitality professionals to embrace uh, the idea that they have a lot of power and ability to contribute to these solutions uh, through business solutions, making uh, impact, but also making it profitable. Um, and then, you know, we need uh, financing obviously, and uh, so, so excited to be here uh, and really um, see a, a great rise in impact investing, which uh, I feel like what we're seeing in this space just in the last 18 to 24 months is, is so inspiring uh, and meaningful. And then through education and campaign, uh, engaging and empowering our consumers to embrace the idea of doing things differently. All, all of these pieces are, are really necessary in order for us to move forward and scale. Thanks, Keiko. So Linda, same, same question for you. you know, where are you at as a company and what, are your, you know, what do you need to get to where you wanna be in the future? Sure, so I'm gonna be echoing much of what has already been said. Um, we're in the Bay Area right now. We're planning out new geographies right now. Our 
demand is greater than our capacity. So obviously fundraising would uh, help funding to build up new hubs would help. Mostly we want to um, get the word out that the infrastructure actually exists to provide these safe, clean, reusable containers, because I think there's a feeling in the market that single use is better, but in fact, reuse is just as safe, if not more. Uh, we have a repeatable system. We've proven that we have an eight to one labor ratio by using automation and we're very, very consistent. And so let's just get the word out there so that everyone can adopt this type of system. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, Matt, I'm just curious, what are your expansion, Linda? I'm, I'm curious what your expansion plans are. I mean, university, I'm, I'm looking at Sadie right here. I'm thinking universities, I'm thinking, you know, opportunities to, to be in, in those kinds of places. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've been thinking about that, but I, I'm curious. That just yeah, came so, to my mind. Sorry to interrupt, Matt. I, I was just no, like, no worries. No worries. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Especially when we have Sadie here yeah, absolutely. at a major you got, university. You got him on the panel. That's right. Yeah, it's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> we... We started in corporate cafeteria and working with businesses. We are have now been in hotels and hospitality and want to expand that. We know and understand the education system, but have not yet deployed there. And so we would love help with that, as well as we really want to get into healthcare. This is a great solution for assisted living. And, you know, there's no reason why we can't just uh, use the same system that we know works well in one vertical and expand it across these others. Fantastic, Linda. All right. Well, so we got time for one more. Well, hopefully one longish question and then one lightning question. Uh, so um, I'm going to start with we're going to talk about tomorrow. Right. And I think what I really want to think about is, is vision. I mean, you folks are entrepreneurs in this space. You've been helping to build this new reuse movement. You know, what is what is your vision for the future? And if you could wave a magic wand, what would the future look like for your business and for uh, this new reuse economy? Um, Keiko, we're gonna start with you this time. I, I mean, a, a full conversion to all I want is a total revolution, Matt. <laughs> I just want a full on reuse revolution. There are so, I mean, to whether it be CPG or the work that we're doing in hospitality and entertainment or um, some of the categories that Linda has cited, there, there is so much, so much, so much opportunity. And I think that we as innovators are fully capable of, um, of getting there. I think um, timing is indeed everything. And this is the first time that I can recall where we have uh, an administration that is prioritizing climate, where we have uh, market indicators that investors uh, and consumers are, are bullish and focused on uh, sustainable impact solutions. Uh, and we have, you know, I, I work with so many um, colleagues in the space. We have some of the greatest minds and talent, uh, each in the United States and globally at this. So, so the time is now and, and we are there and, and away we go. Thanks. That's great. Linda, what about you? What, what's, your, what's your vision for the, for the future? If you wave your magic wand, what would it look like? Oh, yeah, exactly. Reduce all the waste. So we had read in 2019 that there was 561 billion single-use disposable foodware thrown out. I and mean, that is a staggering number since COVID. I, in fact, I read one of uh, Tom's articles. I think it's 50% higher now. So it must be in the trillions. And so if we can wave a magic wand, like cut out at least half of it. Love it. We are releasing a report next week that shows that there's a trillion disposables used in the U.S. economy every single year for food service. And we believe we can get to 80 to 86% reduction. So, Tom, uh, you and I have had a long conversation about this on the Indisposable podcast. So if you want the long answer, check out the Indisposable podcast in my interview with Tom. But um, yeah, would love love your answer. You know, what's what's the future look like? Um, you know, so, so I... I, I I agree with everything that's been said, so echo, uh, but, but won't repeat. I think um, what we need to look at this as well is pragmatic, right? Because the future, it can be a long vision, but it's also what happens tomorrow. And I think we need to do a number of things. One is understand that there is no silver bullet, right? Reuse is amazing, but it's not a silver bullet, right? Um, the only silver bullet, honestly, is not buying things. And that's going to be the biggest meditation we have to think about is how do we fundamentally reduce our consumption and buy less stuff? 
that is perhaps the only silver bullet to the environmental movement by far. And every atrocity, whether climate change or waste, echoes from the act of purchase. And then we have to think about where can we eliminate packaging altogether? And there's some great innovations there. Where you know, is, 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 is the ability to recycle at a high rate uh, available like in aluminum? Where is reusable uh, uh, really a strong opportunity and bring as many of these solutions? And then the other thing is we have to meet people where they are. You know, changing people's views and consumer behavior change is epically difficult. I mean, just imagine how hard it would be to convince you to believe in God if you did it or vice versa. Right. And I got to do it over and over. And there's new people born every day. I think <laughs> it's so important to accept what people want and play into it. If people want better design, highlight that reuse is just fundamentally better design. It's way more exciting, beautiful, luxurious to eat off the, you know, the type of plates Linda washes uh, than uh, a disposable plate. And if it's sustainability, great. Right. But we have to meet people where they are and play into what are their desires versus trying to edit those. I think that one of the biggest challenges in our movement is we expect people to be better uh, than they are. And that's uh, not realistic. And it's not gonna create meaningful change for everybody. Uh, uh, and so for me, I think these are the key things we have to start thinking about and then scale, 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 because it's urgent and we're already behind. So we're, we're at time and I, I want to just start by thanking uh, our panelists and all of you for tuning in to the live stream today. We'll make sure that there's websites and contact information for everybody uh, in the email that's going to follow out. Last quick lightning one sentence answer. <laughs> uh, since we have an audience of investors here, you know, what seeds do you want to plant in their minds about the potential of this sector? Uh, sorry, I got I to gotta say so who goes first. Keiko. <laughs> I went first last time, Matt. <laughs> what, what um, I, I, I think that uh, the most important thing to understand from an investor standpoint is that um, these solutions are, are sustainability and environmental solutions, but they are also business solutions. And there is a very, very uh, rich market out there. Perfect. Linda. Sure. So the, uh, we've proven that the infrastructure, the way we do it with a centralized hub exists and is scalable. The demand is outweighing our capacity right now. And so, you know, the, the market is, is there. We just need to go after it and expand. All right, Tom, one sentence. I'm going to say it slightly differently, but um, we should all vote for the future we want with what we buy and what we don't buy. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And Doug, I'm going to turn it over to you. And sorry for going a few extra minutes here. It's been a really fun conversation. Thanks, everybody. Not at all. Thank you very much, Matt and Keiko and Tom and Linda and Sadie and Philippe. Uh, what a fascinating discussion. And this couldn't be a better segue into our next, uh, our next panel, which includes two very well-recognized individuals that have spent a lot of time in the impact investment space. I ended up meeting Lena Constant Inovici a number of years ago. Actually, it was when New Day first got involved in their ocean work at an oceans event here in San Francisco. We've gotten a lot closer over the course of the last couple of months. And then Kurt Lieberman, who is the co-portfolio manager for our ocean health portfolio at New Day. We have an adage that we use among this group of impact organizations that we work with that it's important for all of us to get informed to get involved and get invested in these issues. And you know what Tom and the panelists were saying um, in the wrap up of the last session was really, really important. We all have a responsibility to conduct ourselves in a way that drives this kind of change. So the next piece of this is going to be talking about how we invest privately in organizations like the three that you just heard from and in public organizations as well, large publicly traded organizations that are working towards the betterment of ocean health and sustainability. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Lena. Uh, Lena, if you could open the stage and then we're gonna have you and Kurt speak with one another in more of a net or less an open format and talk about how we actually engage from an investment perspective. Happy World Oceans Day, everybody. It's a delight to be here and looking forward to this conversation with Kurt. A bit about my background, all the organizations that I founded and that I serve on the boards of are at the intersection of human health 
and environment. And so we've heard a lot about the waste side of the plastics issue. I'll talk a little bit about the, the toxicity side and what that means from an investment strategy perspective for investors in both public and private companies. So a couple of uh, facts that have not been shared. There are some great ones that have been shared by the previous panel, just to add to that, to set some context before we get into the uh, investment strategies portion, 50 to 80% of the oxygen we breathe is uh, comes from our oceans. The oceans sequester 93% of the carbon that's been emitted so far on our planet. And ocean health is inextricably linked to our own ability to, uh, to live and survive. Imagine if we had to over the next couple of years or even a couple of decades, um, adapt to breathing on 50 to 80% less oxygen. So even if the other compelling facts don't, uh, don't stick with you or don't feel relevant or personal, hopefully that one does. Babies are born pre-polluted with over 100 toxic chemicals in their bodies today. And the two classes of materials that most of the most egregious uh, toxins on the planet, also known as the dirty dozen, the endocrine disrupting chemicals that have the biggest impact on human health, are found in two classes of products, plastics and agricultural uh, chemicals. So the plastics uh, side is, uh, there's a very close corollary when we look at public markets in terms of what happened with Monsanto. So I'd like to share some elements of the Monsanto story because it is, um, it is a corollary and very uh, closely relevant to what's happening with companies that have endocrine disrupting chemicals in, uh, uh, in their supply chains and in their products. You may remember a couple of years ago, uh, Monsanto went through a series of lawsuits. Well, thousands of lawsuits were filed, but two were successfully um, brought to, to trial with the outcome of very large awards. Uh, the second one was um, $2 billion um, in finding in favor of the plaintiffs. So what happened? Even if you don't care about giving babies cancer, which uh, of, course, uh, of course everyone should, even if you're specifically only looking at these opportunities from an investment perspective as a fiduciary, taking all other impact related um, considerations out of the equation, the point that I would like to make is that this is simply a bad investment what happened, and it carries unnecessary risk and um, uh, disproportionate risk. So what happened when this, these verdicts, uh, essentially when the courts agreed that the Roundup uh, or atrazine component in Roundup was causing cancer, was linked to cancer, Monsanto's value plummeted by 30% overnight, the stock value. Within a few weeks, 10,000 employees were, were let go from Monsanto Bayer. This was shortly after the, the Monsanto Bayer merger. And so even if none of the other elements of this story feel relevant, simply as um, from an investment perspective, there's a level of risk in investing in companies that have endocrine disrupting chemicals in their product that is certainly uh, worth considering. Another thing happened um, to Bayer Monsanto at the time, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the regulatory um, uh, parameters in the EU shifted over a few months. I think it was something like 10 months after these verdicts, most countries in the EU had made the use of glyphosate illegal. Uh, so meaning that overnight or, or practically overnight in a matter of months, the company lost access to one of its largest markets. So I'd like to, to leave it there on the public company side um, to think about where these, uh, these kinds of impacts create risk and, um, and why it might be a, a prudent strategy to invest in a way that, um, uh, that doesn't take on this unnecessary risk of 
uh, toxic chemicals and specifically endocrine disrupting chemicals in the supply chains and products of these companies. On the private company side, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are uh, one of the guidelines that we set as a global community about the kind of future that we want to create. When we look at investments, ranking investments by SDG from highest level of investment to lowest, oceans are next to last in terms of the uh, investment capital uh, that, that uh, ocean solutions receive. So this may be something to consider if you're looking as an investor, as an impact investor or investor in private companies to create um, catalytic impact. Oceans are a, a space that's ripe for innovation and impact investment capital. <coughs> there are a few elements in the impact investing space that I'd like to, uh, to just call out. The investment uh, in, in the impact investing space, there's a great deal of interest in investing in oceans and even some sense of urgency that investing in the ocean space is important. However, there's um, insufficient access to grounded scientific information. So for example, if you want to understand what's happening from a scientific perspective, in the ocean space, there's a 1700 page report that you can read. I don't know too many funders that will read a 1700 page report. And, uh, and it's also framed in PhD scientific language that's not necessarily accessible to an investor or a foundation um, program manager who's um, giving out grants for ocean solutions. So translating the science in a way that is relevant and accessible to investors is critical. And also, um, excuse me, <coughs> also understanding the ecosystem of funders. So understanding who else is funding uh, certain areas. So again, where certain aspects of ocean health may be overfunded or underfunded, and then being able to make that decision about where you want to contribute and uh, play a role. Uh, the other uh, the other issue from an LP perspective is the scope of focus of um, ocean impact investing funds. So. As, as we've been hearing, there are many, many different issues, um, plastics certainly being one of them, overfishing, ocean acidification. Uh, there are many different kinds of solutions that are vastly different from one another. So if you're looking at an opportunity to invest, let's say, in a fund that's focused on oceans as a general topic, um, and there's not sufficient deep expertise on the team in each of those area, areas, uh, making a good decision in the sourcing, diligence, and structuring of these deals becomes a real challenge. So the more focused and reflective of the expertise of the uh, fund managers, the fund is the more successful, the more um, opportunity for success the fund will have. Um, and just to introduce a couple of my affiliations, I'm the founding partner of BBC Fund, which stands for Better Value Creation. Um, and we are focused on three different aspects of ocean health. One is alternatives to plastics that are non-toxic, biodegradable, and benign to humans and the environment. The second is alternatives to agricultural chemicals that cause dead zones in the oceans. We have 500 of them the size of the UK. So we're looking at, um, sorry, Doug. Uh, and then the third is ocean health solutions such as uh, AI and um, some of the technologies that help us understand what's happening with the oceans, but also um, coatings for, that prevent biofouling and so on. On the nonprofit side, I founded a nonprofit called Innovation 4.4, and we've just launched uh, last year a prize 
for plastic um, pollution and toxicity solutions. And we're announcing today the finalists of that prize. I'll share a couple of them uh, with you. And we've had over 100 entries from all over the world, uh, both in alternatives to plastics and also in the what do we do with the plastic that's already there uh, category of plastic collection and processing. Am I going on too long, Doug? <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to cover the public side as well. And of course, so of why course. don't we pause here? I'm going to shift gears over to Kurt Lieberman. And Kurt, you've obviously spent a lot of time investigating the public side of, of ocean health. And certainly, Lena, this is an area that you can comment on as well. But um, Kurt, any observations that you'd like to share for today's call that would be worthy for people to pay, uh, to pay attention to? I can unmute myself. I don't have control over the video. So um, glad to be on the panel. Excellent panel. Thank you all. It's been really informative. Lena, I second your comments. Um, so um, there we go. Here I am. A uh, couple thoughts. Um, I think there's less need for not zero, but less need for scientific expertise for public companies, just because there's so much disclosure and there's so much observation of them. And for a lot of investors, they really don't have access to the private markets. It requires a rather substantial investment. There's regulatory hurdles. One way people can vote with their pocketbook, in addition to the prior panel, which talked about how you spend your money or choose not to spend your money is how you choose to invest. And earlier there was a talk about avoiding companies that do bad things. And I think your comment about Baron Monsanto is right on. They spent 60 somewhat, $66 billion to buy Monsanto. And it's been an absolutely horrible investment. As an investor, you don't want to be part of those bad investments, but also I think you're, I suggest that the standard should be higher. It's not just avoiding companies that are bad, but finding companies that do good. And what I'd like to do is give you a couple examples. I'm not trying to give you specific investment advice. What I'm trying to do is say that there are opportunities out there and you don't necessarily need to sacrifice investment results to find good companies. Good companies can be very good investments. And I'd like to highlight five. <clears throat> First one is a company called Clean Harbors, its symbol is CLH. We rank it in the second of 10, uh, we rank companies based on 10 levels of attractiveness. It's in our second most attractive category. It's part of our, the New Day Impact Healthy Ocean portfolio. The company's based in Norwell, Massachusetts. It basically does clean up. It is removing problems out of water. It's what we would call a pure play in the sense that it does exactly in our portfolio what the portfolio is about. It also happens to um, get a classification from us called Alpha Generator, which means we insert it in the portfolio because we believe it will do better than most of the stocks in the marketplace and actually contribute to positive returns. For those of you who are not from financial services, sorry for all the qualifications. It's a regulatory requirement. We can't promise things. So we have to say we believe in all the rest. Um, a second company I encourage you to take a look at is Ocean Marine Exploration, O-M-E-X is the ticker. Um, it's not one we've had a chance to rate because it's relatively small. It does some very interesting work. Uh, as you probably know, the conversion to a clean carbon-free economy is going to require a lot of battery technology. And battery technology requires stuff called rare earth elements, lithium and cobalt and a variety of other um, compounds. They're not as rare as the name implies, but it is really ugly to mine them and to process them. Turns out, there are a lot of them in the water and ocean marine exploration has developed technology to be able to go after those 
elements and do it in an environmentally responsible way which is exciting on multiple levels from a sustainability perspective. Let me cover two larger companies, both of which you probably know. One is HP Inc, HPQ is the symbol. They've taken a real leadership position on reusability of plastics. They're the people that make all those inkjet printers with the toner cartridges. They've demonstrated real leadership in getting the cartridges back and reusing them to make new cartridges, recycling similar to the way people do with aluminum cans and with glass. At a similar level, Dell Technologies, Dell of PC fame, is another one. Uh, their symbol is Dell, D-E-L-L. -L. Both of them are part of the formation of a group called Next Wave Plastics, which is a consortium of businesses that are attempting to be more responsible in the use of plastics and to propagate standards for other companies to use. Other uh, next wave companies include General Motors, Herman Miller, Interface, and Trek Bikes. Trek's kind of close to my heart because my daughter's a triathlete, so um, she's very familiar with uh, those products. Last company um, I'm gonna, uh, mention is a company called Moe. It's not a US company, it's a Scandinavian company. They are doing work to attempt to build sustainable seafood uh, agriculture, basically, aquaculture. Uh, they are working on sustainable farms for salmon. Uh, they have an ADR, for those of you not familiar with ADRs, it may, basically means you can buy a foreign company stock on the US markets. Their symbol is MNHF, pardon me, MNHVF. And a fairly good sized company, about 14 billion is their worth. Um, and if you take a look at what's gonna be required to supply protein for a growing planet, I think the idea that we're gonna give up protein it's, that's a bridge too far. There are a lot of vegans, there's a lot of vegetarians, there's still a need for protein in some form. We need to find more environmentally responsible ways of producing that protein, uh, both on the land, but also in the water. Uh, one, as almost everyone on this webinar knows, we're badly depleting the polluted oceans because we overfish them. And if we can find ways to sustainably source fish, for consumption, I think that's a wonderful step in the right direction. I'm not trying to say these are the only five companies. Our portfolios have around 50 companies. There are many other companies that are doing good things related to oceans. I just wanted to highlight five to give you a sample that you can make a decision today to invest in companies that are helping for the future, whether it's with us, through the, our uh, Healthy Oceans portfolio or directly in your Schwab or other form of account or Robinhood or whatever tool you use. Investing is part of being a responsible person, using your money consistent with your values. I'm preaching to the choir here because I think everyone on this believes in that. With that, Doug, happy to answer questions. Turn it back. Sorry if we've gone over. Not at all. Kurt and Lena, can't thank you enough for your participation this afternoon. Very, very interesting uh, discussion around the investment piece. And I'm sure that both Kurt and Lena would be happy to take additional questions. And maybe each one of you can pop your emails into the chat here too. Um, so with that, Nigel, I'm going to turn things back to you and Paul for a wrap up. This has been an incredible session. I'd like to say just in conclusion that this is all about action from here. One of the primary reasons that ESGX was pulled together is to not just deliver information out to the public whereby they could engage in all of these important issues, but we want all of you, whether you're an individual or an institution, to join in the effort to affecting transformational change. So with that, I'll turn things back to you, Nigel and Paul. Thank you very much indeed, Doug, and to all our panelists, it's been really, a fantastic discussion, I think, for me, inspirational and informational in equal measure and a few points where I confess I was left with a tear in my eye for some of the wonderful work being done, which is so very important. 
I was going to add just one piece of detail. I think at a couple of places we've mentioned the point about voting with your money. The amount of funds flowing into sustainable investment pools is growing rapidly. These are quarterly figures of fund flows. A big chunk of this is still in Europe, which is ahead of the US. But that pool now globally is something like $2 trillion. And we're starting to see it in more asset classes, not just equities and debt. So I think that is incredibly encouraging. Uh, and I think with that as my my kind of final passing point, I will hand over to Paul just to talk about uh, some of the episodes we've got coming up. Thanks, Nigel. And uh, thanks to everybody today um, for joining us for World Oceans Day and our speakers, panelists, and of course, you, our super engaged audience, who's going to turn this into action and in how you shop, where you work, how you invest, and even how you vote. Um, all these sessions are recorded and uh, kept on ESGX.org and also at live.esgx.org, which sends you to YouTube. So please hit the like, uh, subscribe, uh, and share buttons for those. And we have a really exciting June um, uh, continuing. So we call this the summer swell. Thanks to Nick Gower for coining the summer swell for June. So today's World Oceans Day event uh, next week in the morning Pacific time. We have the Roads to Refuge, um, and so Doug Heskey of New Day will again uh, lead and curate uh, that discussion. Um, and as you can see, the panelists here, you can read up on on the ESGX.org site, uh, will join us. Then uh, in the afternoon, we'll talk about investing for your future, uh, specifically through 401ks and individual retirement accounts, IRAs. So Megan Morris, one of the co-authors of the Global Handbook of Impact Investing, which hopefully you will all read, which is a 1,300 page book, bigger than war and peace, with more peace than war, um, has a full chapter on that. And we'll do a deep dive on how you can shift your 401k, 403b, or your personal retirement. Then the following week, uh, thanks Nigel for holding up the book, even with one hand, you're very strong. <laughs> Then uh, the next week is the Green Jobs Report, the monthly Green Jobs Report, uh, where green jobs have been not only more resilient during COVID, uh, they've continued to be higher paying. And we're gonna do a deep dive into something called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. So you may be familiar with the Nuclear Arms Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, a similar threat to our existence is the ongoing use of fossil fuels. So we'll have the usual green jobs a bunch together here along with uh, Mark Campanale and others working on the non-proliferation treaty of fossil fuels. And then in the final week of June, right before July 4th and in the first half of the year, uh, this month is the 100 year anniversary of the um, uh, Black Wall Street massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and shifting that from not only remembrance to actually taking action. Um, uh, Doug Heskey of New Day has helped us and Kurt Lieberman of New Day have helped us organize the Investing for Economic Inclusion. So please join us for one or hopefully all of those. Feel free to share them with your communities. I uh, hope you found today to be informing and educational, but also action oriented. Uh, I hadn't thought about dishwashing robots before. I, you know, excited about getting my uh, coffee from a robot, uh, whether it be in San Francisco downtown or at the airport. And of course, there's robots that flip burgers. And if you watch 60 Minutes, you'll see robots that dance, including dog robots that dance. Um, so there's lots of solutions uh, to, to be had here and to pursue, both in your portfolio, in your work, and your everyday shopping. So on behalf of all of us at ESGX, my co-host, Nigel Lake, our producer, Nick Gower, Doug Heskey for curating all of us, Philippe Cousteau for joining us, and all of our panelists, including Lena Konstantinovici. Uh, we wish you a, a great rest of the day and look forward to seeing you next time on ESGX.org.